I don't know what name to call you by, whether by your own name, so soft and proud, or whether by that of friend, which says so much and yet says nothing. I don't know whether I should write here the word that my respect for you imposes upon me, or the word that my heart inspires. Perhaps I had better call you by no name at all. Perhaps I ought not to struggle against the unconquerable superior will that dominates me. I am so poor a creature. I am so devoid of moral strength that the best part of my soul is unconscious of what it does. And when I attempt to act, I am defeated from the onset. Is it not true? Ah... Oh. There is never an hour of noble and fruitful battle in my heart. Only an utter ignorance of things, of feelings, a complete surrender to the sweetness of love, and thereby the loss of all peace, all hope. How you must despise me. You are just and wise. You can't help despising a poor, weak little thing like me. A woman whose heart is always open whose imagination is always ready to take fire, whose changeable mind is never fixed, whose veins, though cured of their great fever, are still burning, as if her rebellious blood could do nothing but burn, burn, burn. If you despise me, and your eyes, your voice, your manner, all tell me that you do, you are quite right. I never seem to be doing wrong, Yet I am always doing it. And then, when I see it, it is too late to make good my error, to recover my own happiness, or to restore that of others. Ah, oh, despise me. Despise me. You are right to despise me. I bend to every wind that blows, like a broken reed. I am overturned and rent by the tempest, for I know neither how to defend myself nor how to die. Despise me. No one can despise me as you can. No one has so good a right to do it. When you are away from me, I can think of you with a certain amount of courage, trusting to your kindness, to your charity, to forgive me my lack of strength. When you are away from me, I feel myself more a woman, braver. I can dream of being something to you, not an equal, no, but a humble follower in the things of the soul. Dreams, dreams. When you are with me, all my faith in myself disappears. I recognize how feeble I am, how extravagant, how incoherent. No more, never more, can I hope for your indulgence. I think of my past. Justly and cruelly, you reproached me with it. And I find in it such a multitude of childish illusions, such an entirely false standard of life and love, such a monstrous abandonment of all right womanly traditions that my shame rushes in a flame to my face. Have you not noticed it? Before that fatal day at Pompeii, the first day of my real existence, I had a treasury of feelings, of impressions, of ideas, my own personal ones, by which my life was regulated, or rather by which it was disturbed. They were swept away, they were destroyed, they disappeared from my soul on that day. To you, who showed me how great my fault was, to you, who trampled down all that I had cared for, I bow my head. I bow my spirit. You were right. You are right. You only are right. You are always right. I want to convince you that I see the truth clearly now. Let me walk behind you. Let me follow you as a servant follows her master. Ah, give me a little strength, you who are strong. You who have never erred. You who have conquered yourself to the world, give me strength. You who seems to me the model of calmness and justice above all hazards. Because you have known how to suffer in silence above all human joy. 
because you understand its emptiness, and yet so kind, so indulgent, so quick to forgive, because you are a man and never forget to be a man. You despise me, that is certain, for all strong natures must despise weakness. But it is also certain that you pity me, because I am buffeted about by the storms of life without a compass, without a star. I have already once been wrecked. In that wreck, I left behind me years of health and hope, the best part of my youthful faith. And now I am in danger of being wrecked again, utterly and forever, unless you save me. Say what you will to me, do what you will with me, insult me after having despised me, but don't leave me to my weakness. Don't withdraw your support from me. It is my only help. What shall I call you? Friend? Friend, I shall be lost if you do not save me. If you refuse to allow my soul to follow yours, strengthened by your strength, if you cast me out from your spiritual presence, if you do not give me the support that my life finds in yours. Friend, 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 don't cast me off. Say what you will, do what you will, but don't separate me from you. If you do, I shall die. I, a beggar, knock at your door. The letter continued. You wounded me profoundly when you said that it was perhaps Giustino Morelli, the man for whose sake I refused to marry Luigi Caracciolo. I cannot hear the bare name of Morelli without shuddering with contempt. It isn't that I am angry with him, no, no. It is that he does not exist for me. He is the vain shadow of a dead man. On the evening of the Huguenots, ah me, that music sings constantly in my soul. I shall never forget it. He was there, and I didn't see him. I wouldn't see him. I don't hate him. He was a poor, weak fool. Honest, perhaps, for you have said so, but small in heart and mind. And thus my contempt for him is really contempt for myself, who made an idol of him. How was I ever able to be so blind? When I think of it, I wring my hands in desperation, for it was before him that I burned the first pure incense of my heart. I shall never forgive myself. Cesare Diaz read this letter twice through. Then he left his house to go about his affairs and his pleasures. Returning home, he read it for a third time. Thereupon he wrote the following note, which he immediately sent off. Dear Anna, all that you say is very well, but I don't know yet who the man is that you love. Very cordially, Cesare Diaz. She read it and answered with one line. I love you, Anna Aquaviva. Cesare Diaz waited a day before he replied. Dear Anna, very well. And what then, Cesare Diaz? In the exultation of her passion, she had taken a step whereby she risked her entire future happiness. And she knew it. She had taken the humiliating step of declaring her love. Would Diaz hate her? She had expected an angry letter from him, a letter saying that he would never see her again. Instead of which, she had received a colorless little note, neither warm nor cold, treating her declaration as he might have treated any most ordinary incident of his day. That was the unkindest cut of all. Cesare Diaz was simply indifferent. For her, love was a tragedy. For him, it was an ordinary incident of his day. What to do now? She could not think. What to do? What to do? Had he himself not asked with a light curiosity? And what then? 
He had asked it with the sort of curiosity one might show for the continuation of a novel one was reading. All night long she sobbed upon her pillow. What is the matter? asked Laura, waking up. Nothing. Go to sleep. In the morning, she wrote to him again. Why do you ask me, what then? I don't know. I cannot answer. God has allowed me to love a second time. I know nothing of then. I only know one thing. I love you. Perhaps you have known it too this long while. My eyes, my voice, my words, wherein my soul knelt before you, must have told you that I loved you. Have you not seen me bow my proud head daily in humility before you? I began to love you that evening when we came home together from Pompeii, when my fever was beginning. Afterwards, my whole nature was transformed by my love of you. I do not ask you to love me. Perhaps you are bound by other loves, past loves. Perhaps you have never loved and wish never to love. Perhaps I don't please you, either spiritually or bodily. What is passing in your mind? Who knows? I only know that you are strong and wise, that you never turn aside, that you follow your noble path tranquilly in the triumphant calm of your greatness. Have you loved? Will you love? Who knows? All I ask is that you will let me love you without being separated from you. I ask that you will promise to wish me well, not as your ward, not as your sister, but as a poor girl who loves you with all her soul and life. I don't ask you to change your habits in any way. The least of your habits, the least of your desires, is sacred to me. Live as you have always lived. Only remember that in a corner of Naples, there is a heart that finds its only reason for existence in your existence. And continue from time to time to give me a minute of your presence. My love will be a silent companion to you. Are you not the same man who said to me, with a voice that trembled with pity, in that dark, empty room at the inn in Pompeii, while I felt that I was dying? Are you not the same man who said, My poor child, my poor child? You pitied me. You do pity me. You will pity me. I know it. I know it. And that is the then of my love. Don't write to me. I should be afraid to read what you might write. Ah, oh, how I love you. How I love you. Anna Aquaviva. Cesare Diaz was very thoughtful after he had read this letter. His vanity, the vanity of a man of 40, was flattered by it. And Anna's love, for the present, at any rate, seemed to be entirely obedient and submissive. But would it remain so? Cesare Diaz had had a good deal of experience. Anna's, he knew to be a proud and self-willed character. Would it always remain on its knees like this? Someday, she would not be content only to love. She would demand to be loved in return. He did not answer the letter. He was an enemy to letter writing in general, to the writing of love letters in particular. And anyhow, what could he say? For two days, he did not call upon her. On the third day, he arrived as usual at two o'clock. Anna, during these days, had lived in a state of miserable suspense and nervousness. What is the matter with her? Stella Martini asked of Laura. I don't know, 